first speaker for today is That's Dr. Michael data. Glennon from Tufts University. He's a professor of international law. Um, prior to teaching, he's a legal counsel for the Senate for Relations, Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, he's since been a full, <coughs> Fulbright Distinguished Professor of International and Constitutional Law at uh, Thomas Magnus University uh, School of Law in Lithuania. He's been a fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars of Washington, D.C. Thomas Hawkins, Johnson Visiting Scholar, United States <coughs> Military Academy, West Point, and Director of Studies at the Hogg Academy of International Law, as well as uh, a visiting professor at the University of Paris. Um, he's been a consultant to various congressional committees, uh, U.S. State Department, and International Atomic Energy Agency. His most recent book is National Security and Double Government. Luke, thank you very much for inviting me to be with you on this cold morning. Um, thank you all for coming out. Good to see you. I'm going to talk today about the so-called deep state, as you know. And uh, as you also know, it's a subject that's been much in the news lately. It seems it's on almost everybody's lips, including the president's. Uh, according to recent polls, something in the neighborhood of two-thirds or even three-fourths the American people believe there is such a thing as the deep state, meaning a secret cadre of officials who manipulate American national security policy. Um, a similar percentage of the people um, sometimes, according to some polls, believe the state is, deep state is an appropriate check on the Trump administration. Others see it as, as a threat in and of itself. It all reminds me a little of the old gag about uh, the famous Patrick Henry speech. Patrick Henry said, give me liberty or give me death. Supposedly a public opinion poll was taken afterwards and it showed that 27 percent of the people were for liberty, 23 percent were for death, and the rest were undecided. Well. So I'm going to talk to you about the, the deep state today, and <clears throat> I'm going to suggest to you that, uh, in short, we, we really don't have a deep state in this country of the sort that has apparently existed in some other countries, such as Turkey. But we do have, or had, more accurately, past tense, um, something similar to the deep state called double government. And I'm going to describe to you this phenomenon of double government as it's existed in the United States. Um, I'm going to um, talk about a little book that I wrote on that subject, National Security and Double Government, describe to you its thesis, um, why I wrote the book, how I was prompted to do it, and because the book was written a couple years before Trump took office, so I'll, I'll then tell you what I think the book got wrong, what I think the book got right, and its implications for the future. So first of all, why did I write this book? <clears throat> well, as Luke mentioned, long before most of you were born, I worked on Capitol Hill. I was the lawyer for the Senate Foreign Relations Committee in the 1970s. And while I was there, the committee decided to conduct a little study. And the study was prompted by some pretty unsettling reports that were coming in basically over the transom to the committee concerning um, harassment, intimidation, surveillance of residents of the United States by secret police forces of other countries, intelligence services of countries such as the Shah's Iran, Savak, Dina, operating on behalf of the uh, military government in Chile, and the services of other countries such as the Philippines, and Taiwan, and several others. And the question was whether these intelligence services were 
is essentially having a chilling effect on the exercise of constitutionally protected activities on the part of residents of the United States, the freedom of association, freedom of assembly, freedom of speech. There were reports, for example, that the Shah's secret police, SAVAK, had infiltrated student organizations on campuses around the country. Uh, there were 30,000 Iranian students here at the time. And the evidence was pretty clear that the Shah was trying to keep tabs on these people to find out whether they were engaged in anti-regime activities by essentially putting double agents, students, in these student organizations. So students, when they demonstrated against the Shah's brutality on the streets of Washington, for example, they had to wear ski masks because there were people within the audience taking photographs of the enemies of the Shah. And when they went back to Iran, they would find that they were pulled off the street by Sabak and were treated rather brutally. Their fingernails were pulled out. Their families were brutalized if they stayed in the United States. Similarly, there's the, you know, the, the, the regime in Chile at the time um, kept very close tabs on dissident Chileans here in the United States. And it got beyond, I might say, keeping close tabs on them. There was a former um, foreign minister of Chile named Orlando Letelier, who was, had fled Chile, and he was involved in a think tank in Washington. And one day, he was driving up um, Massachusetts Avenue around Sheridan Circle in the heart of Embassy Row in Washington. Uh, his research assistant, uh, about your age, named Ronnie Moffat, was, was sitting uh, next to him in the front seat. Her husband, Michael, was sitting in the back seat. As they drove around Sheridan Circle, the car blew up. There had been a bomb planted in the car. Ronnie Moffat was killed instantly. She died in her husband's arms on the side of the road. Uh, Letelier survived. The bomb was planted by the Chilean Secret Service, the, the Saba, or, or Dina, it was called. And it was detonated by an uh, electronic device in a car that was driving right behind it, right in the midst of downtown Washington. These, this assassination effort was, was carried out. And <clears throat> so the, the, the question arose for the committee um, what is the United States government doing to prevent these kinds of activities from occurring? And the committee, in deciding to get to the bottom of this, um, confronted a little obstacle. Why? Because, guess what? Some of these regimes, such as Iran and Chile, were allies of the United States. They were allies of the United States. And guess what? Allies help allies. Intelligence services in those countries received assistance from American intelligence services. So they were very reluctant to give up information. Nonetheless, the committee asked the staff, myself included, to um, get to the bottom of this. And to do that, we interviewed dozens of individuals, intelligence officials, law enforcement officials, diplomats in the CIA, in the FBI, in the State Department, in the National Security Agency. We've reviewed thousands of pages of classified documents. We had multiple security clearances above top secret. The people that we interviewed frequently had aliases. They wouldn't give us their accurate names. They had been 
um, case officers with the CIA attached to embassies abroad. So we went, as it were, straight to the horse's mouth. And we prepared a report for the committee on this, which is still, unfortunately, classified top secret sensitive. It was downgraded to that level. In the process of preparing that report and conducting that study, I had a vantage point into the inner workings of the national security bureaucracy of this government that very few people have ever had, even within the bureaucracy itself, because it's so tightly compartmented. And I'll simply tell you that it looks very, very differently from the inside than it looks from the outside. And one of the things that you would have discovered if you had been part of the investigation is that there was an astounding continuity in American national security policy from the previous administration, the Ford administration, into the Democratic Carter administration. Now, you would have thought from the outside that a president such as Jimmy Carter, who made human rights his calling card, would have instituted a 90 degree turn, 180 degree turn, on our relationship with Savak and Dina and these different authoritarian states. Well, guess what? You would have been surprised because there was tremendous continuity from, from one administration to the next. That just struck me as strange. And I remembered that over the years, I've, I never wrote anything about it, but it always stuck in the back of my mind. And then during the Obama administration, I had exactly the same reaction. From the outside, I wasn't part of the Obama administration, but you look at the national security policy of the Obama administration, and there was an astonishing continuity from the Bush administration. Yes, Obama did end torture. Actually, it had been ended at the end of the Bush administration. Obama didn't end it. Bush ended it. Um, but you go policy after policy after policy, and you would find that they remained roughly con continuous. Prosecution of whistleblowers, far more frequent during the Obama administration than the Bush administration. Drone strikes, covert operations, claiming the state secrets privilege to stop lawsuits against the government for alleged national security violations. This book that I wrote um, details these policies um, over a period of pages. So, um, I, as I say, this, this just, I, I had a sense of deja vu, reading the headlines day after day. One rainy day, I pulled down a dusty, musty old book from my bookshelf called The English Constitution, a quaint old book with no relevance to what's happening today, right? It was written in 1868 by a fellow named Walter Badgett, who was one of the founders of The Economist magazine. It's still today regarded as the single most important commentary on the operation of the British Constitution. And I was astonished in reading the book that it seemed to be describing exactly what I had seen. And I'll tell you why. Badgett's theory in a nutshell is this, but before I proceed to tell you, this guy, Walter Badgett, was no, you know, radical. He was at the epicenter of the British establishment. 
He was one of the founders of The Economist magazine, the financial journal of the international financial establishment today. Um, you may have seen the scene in the movie where Queen Elizabeth is being tutored on the work of Walter Badgett. This is mainline traditional establishment commentary on the British Constitution, the authoritative work of British jurisprudence on constitutional law. So Badgett's theory was this. It was, it was fairly simple and straightforward. His, his, the question Badgett confronted in the book was, how did Britain move from being a monarchy to a republic? And his answer was, it happened covertly. It happened because there were two sets of institutions in Britain, what he called the dignified institutions and the efficient institutions. The dignified institutions were for public show. The British population believed that those institutions ran the government, but in fact, they didn't. The British people were wrong. The government was actually run by a set of concealed institutions, the efficient institutions. The dignified institutions, the House of Lords, the monarchy, maintained public respect But it was, in fact, the concealed institutions that the public knew little about, the prime minister, the cabinet, the House of Commons, that managed the day-to-day -day affairs of the British people. And as power shifted gradually from the dignified institutions to the efficient institutions, Britain changed gradually from a monarchy to a republic. Magnificent theory, widely accepted among um, Jewish, uh, British, British uh, jurisprudential experts, as I say. So my realization in reading this book was that the United States itself had this system of double government just as Badgett had described in Britain, we too have developed a bifurcated set of institutions. One set for public show and a second set that operates behind the scenes in the realm of national security. And I, I underscore that. I'm talking about in the realm of national security. The public institutions are the presidency, the Congress, and the courts, what I call the Madisonian institution, which the people in this country believe, run, define, manage American national security policy. But in fact, that policy is managed behind the scenes by a network of several hundred managers of the intelligence community, the law enforcement community, and the military, the CIA, the NSA, the FBI, and to a lesser extent, the State Department. The people believe that the Madisonian institutions are in charge, but it is, in fact, the so-called Trumanite network, as I call it, that traces back to the Truman administration when the great transfer of power began that actually call the shots. And this is what is more than anything else responsible for the tremendous transfer of authority over national security policy that's occurred in this country over the last 70 years from Congress and the courts and the presidency to the national security bureaucracy. There's one key difference. In the case of Britain, double government caused Britain to move 
from a monarchy to a, what Badgett referred to as a concealed republic. In the United States, the movement has been in the opposite direction. The United States has moved from a republican form of government, a democracy, in the direction of an autocracy, an autocracy in which democratic accountability has become less and less over that 70-year period as power has shifted to unelected bureaucrats who run the national security apparatus. Take a look at each one of the actors within this system of double government, and you'll see what I mean. Congress. Now, a lot of people think, well, we have, you know, a Congress that makes the laws, oversee the intelligence community, um, give them a kick in the behind when they get out of line, and keep close tabs on what they're doing. Well, I'm, I'm sorry to tell you, but the watchdogs are asleep at the switch. You know, take, take one example of many. A couple years ago, the Senate Intelligence Committee, the principal watchdog of the intelligence community, came out with this big report on torture, big report on torture, describing how the Bush administration had engaged in the most brutal practices. Well, look at the role of the intelligence community during this long history. They didn't know, the intelligence community, c committee, Senate Intelligence Committee didn't know that black site prisons, secret torture centers had been established around the world by the CIA. They didn't know that waterboarding was occurring there. They didn't know that the waterboarding was being videotaped. They didn't know that the videotapes were destroyed. I could go on and on. In the report, read, read, read the, the footnotes of the report and you will see it's only a, a tiny sliver of what was going on. 9,500 documents were requested by the Intelligence Committee and not turned over by the Obama White House. The committee asked three times. Obama didn't even respond. The CIA gets what it wants, Obama said, quote unquote. The CIA gets what it wants, he said to his staff, the National Security Council, as reported in Mark Mazzetti's book. And he might as well have said the same thing about other elements of the intelligence community, including the National Security Agency, for example. You know, Edward Snowden, with these leaks four years ago, um, reported that they were engaged in mass surveillance of the American people, contrary to claims that were made under oath by the heads of these agencies, as you know. Um, the, the claims were made under oath, and um, the question arose, well, who authorized this? The National Security Advisor to President Obama said he never knew. John Kerry, who was Secretary of State at the time, was asked, how could this happen? Angela Merkel's cell phone was tapped. She took great offense at this. She thought she was Obama's friend. And Kerry's response was, well, some of these programs are just on automatic pilot. Automatic pilot? What's happened to democratic accountability? 
The Senate Intelligence Committee never knew about this. So that's one branch. Look at the courts. Think of the courts. Look, I, I teach national security law. I'm a lawyer. I've written books on the subject. I, I have a challenge for you. Try to find a case in which anybody who claims the most serious violations of their rights by the government in the realm of national security has won a dime in damages or even had a day in court. You will not find more than a handful of cases. Why? Because the courts are friends of the management in the realm of national security. They defer to the national security bureaucracy. We're going to open it up to questions uh, in the second half of the hour, so you'll have plenty of time. Um, over and over and over, cases are dismissed on the basis of the political question doctrine. Not ripe, no standing, moot. State secrets privilege. Here's an example. A guy named El Masri, a German citizen, is arrested in Macedonia by the Macedonian authorities at the behest of the CIA. The guy says, yeah, I'm sorry, but you've got the wrong guy. I don't have anything to do with Al-Qaeda or ISIS or anybody else. I'm just an ordinary Joe Schmo. Well, it turned out some clerk made a mistake. The guy, nonetheless, was kidnapped by the Macedonian authorities, taken to a hotel room in the capital, held there for weeks, incommunicado, no lawyer. He just disappeared. His family had no idea where he'd gone. They told him if he tried to escape, they would kill him. The CIA then took him, flew him around the world to a black site prison where he was brutally tortured. Your stomachs would turn if I told you what they did to him. Finally, they concluded we got the wrong guy. So they drop him off in the middle of nowhere in a dirt road in rural Albania. He works his way back. He thinks, you know, geez, American courts surely will see the injustice here. So he files an action in the federal courts. What's the response of the com intelligence community? Oh no, you can't hear this case. It would involve making secret information available to the public, state secrets privilege. And the courts say, yes, case dismissed. They never heard his story. So what does he do? He goes to Europe and he brings an action in the European Court of Human Rights against the European authorities that were responsible for this. Fifteen to nothing, they come down on his side. That's how we know that the facts that I've just described are accurate. They found those facts. He had to go to Europe to get justice. That's the oversight that the judiciary has given us in this country. So, um, what is this group, what I've referred to as the Trumanite, the Trumanite um, network? Is this a deep state? My answer is not exactly. It's more in the nature of what Badgett referred to as a set of concealed institutions. There was no point at which the United States made a decision to establish this 
concealed managerial directorate. We just drifted into it. It emerged over a period of years, almost through inadvertence. It's a, it's a, it's, it's the product, product of boring principles of organizational behavior described by sociologists such as Max Faber that go way back. And there's a lot of scholarship about the phenomena that I've been talking about. Regulatory capture, the way the Senate Intelligence Committee has been captured by the entities that it's supposed to oversee. The way that members of Congress and judges defer to the experts in the national security bureaucracy. Why? Well, think about it for a minute. You've, some of you have been involved in political campaigns. You know that candidates and members of Congress, the best of them, are generalists. They have tremendous demands on their time. They've got to be knowledgeable about all kinds of subjects, from tax breaks to Medicare, health care, to farm subsidies, to money for the new F-35. You name it. You've got to be conversant about those topics. So when somebody from the CIA or the NSA or the Pentagon comes in to brief you, and they tell you, here's the threat, here's the amount of money we've got to spend, this is the program that we've got to put into place to counteract it, are you really going to stand up to them and say, no, I think you're wrong? No. You're going to say, well, you're the expert, and by the way, if there's a terrible terrorist attack on this country, you, you won't say this, but you'll think it. If there's another 9-11, I don't want somebody pointing at me as the person who voted against this. I don't want to be the person fingered as being responsible for that. And the way to pass the buck is you go with the experts. Look, I was told by the briefers, this is what we need to do. I told them to do it. I told them, go ahead, you know. Listen in on our phone calls. Listen in. Read, read the emails. Penetrate those student groups. So there's a tremendous incentive to go along. Seriously, uh, on the other side, there's a, there's a converse incentive on the part of the experts to resist kibitzers. You know, you don't want somebody looking over your shoulder, second-guessing you, who doesn't know as much about it as you do. It's just a natural human tendency. So you, you see this synergistic effect occurring, and there's, there's, there's a, as a consequence, um, a massive transfer of power, as I've said, from the elected representatives of the people to the national security bureaucracy. It's a lot more complicated than that. We can get into it more if you wish, but that's the fundamental dynamic. So, um, I, I don't, in short, believe that there is a deep state. It's not as though there's been some silent coup in which a group of nefarious plotters have taken over the government of the United States. That's ridiculous. There's no, there's no um, secret organization of the sort that supposedly has existed in other countries, such as Turkey, that engages in um, kidnapping, knocks on the door at night, disappearances. That's wholly foreign to the American experience. In effect, though, 
and, and, and there's no conspiracy behind what I've just described. The people who work in the national co security bureaucracy are not evil people. They're patriotic, well-educated, hardworking, decent Americans. They're simply responding to incentives that are buried deeply and Im embedded within the structure of the American political system. And, and the, their behavior is predictable, as I, as I have said, through widely accepted principles of organizational behavior that, that describe um, phenomena such as programs that are sticky down, that are, that are more likely to continue than to be terminated. Why? Because your boss was present at the creation and helped design those programs. You're not going to be the one to stand up and tell your boss, hey, this program should be ended. It's silly. It's now counterproductive. No. These programs develop a life of their own. They're on automatic pilot, as Kerry said. He was right. So um, th there's, no, there's no deep state in this country. And it, it just confuses matters to refer to this as a deep state. Moreover, if there were a deep state, in, in a sense, the problem would be easier to address. If there were some you know, cadre of people who had staged a silent coup, they could be arrested and tried. And it could be, it could be cut out. But it's not like that. It's, it's a phenomenon that is deeply embedded in the structure of the American system. And it's very, very difficult to address. Now, um, why has it persisted for so long? Or, as I said before, this is really past tense. Why did it persist for so long? For a very simple reason that was identified by Walter Badgett, the, the, the one essential condition for its operation was that both sets of institutions have to remain on the same page publicly. There can be no daylight between the two. They have to project an image of harmony to the public. No disagreement. Why? because it would undermine the legitimacy of the presidency, and it would undermine the legitimacy of the national security bureaucracy as well. That is why it seemed to me that no president would ever launch a frontal assault on the national security bureaucracy because it would create a rift between the chief executive and the Trumanite network. And they would both suffer in terms of legitimacy. This is the first point I'll suggest to you and, and the principal point on which the book was wrong. Donald Trump has, has done exactly what I said in the book, no president would reasonably be expected to do. Cause of an enormous public break with the national security bureaucracy. But look at the language that Trump used. He called the leaders of the FBI stormtroopers, hacks. He referred, compared the, the leaders of the CIA to the Gestapo. He said he knew more about military strategy than our generals. And, you know, look at the rifts on policy that continue to this day. Trump announces, we're going to withdraw 2,000 troops from Syria. And the Pentagon responds by saying, well, not really. Trump gives hints that we may just be 
ready to withdraw from NATO. And the Pentagon, through its emissaries, calms the waters with our NATO allies. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. The FBI investigates the president in a counterintelligence investigation predicated on the possibility that the President of the United States has been operating as the witting or unwitting agent of a foreign power, the Russian Federation, that is an adversary to the United States. This is what I said in the book was unlikely ever to happen. Why? Again, because it has had exactly the effect that Walter Badgett predicted in the English Constitution. Badgett said, if there is ever this kind of rift between the two sets of institutions, the whole structure will come falling to earth like a top that is spinning and falls off the table. And that's exactly what you've seen in the short term the result has been instability and unpredictability. The continuity that I was talking about in national security policy that had occurred before from the Bush administration to the Obama administration, from the Ford administration to the um, Carter administration, has disappeared. Our allies are completely confused. They don't know what the United States is going to do next exactly as Badgett predicted. The long-term effect is, therefore, instability. Instability. And it goes beyond simple policy instability. It goes, as Badgett suggested, to the very legitimacy of the two sets of institutions. And on this point, the book was right. It does undermine the legitimacy of the institutions for the president to use this kind of language in describing the leadership of the CIA and the FBI and the military. <clears throat> Why? Well, for obvious reasons. The, the, um, these, and th this is an extremely important point, these institutions don't derive independent legitimacy because they're smart people or hardworking people or good guys or good girls or whatever. That's not the way it works. They derive legitimacy because of their connection to the presidency through an electoral connection. Remember, we live in a democracy. And the theory has to be what they're doing, they do because they're under the direction of the democratic leadership of the country. The people who are directing them have been democratically elected. Once it becomes clear that they're off on a lark of their own, as the Trump language suggests, their legitimacy is undercut. And they are forced to generate their own legitimacy. That's a very dangerous thing in a democracy. They go directly to the people and suggest, hey, we're the good guys now. You should be supporting us. So the people like Bill Kristol tweet, rather the Trump state than, rather the deep state than the Trump state. And you see over and over again, a lot of people who hate Donald Trump embrace the national security bureaucracy on the theory that the enemy of our enemy is our friend. They don't remember what the church committee reported in the 1970s. They don't remember that the CIA spied on American citizens. They don't remember that the FBI infiltrated student groups of anti-war protesters, 
civil rights activist. They don't remember that the FBI, I mean, J. Edgar Hoover, tried to, through blackmail, urge Martin Luther King to commit suicide just before he accepted the Nobel Peace Prize. They don't remember that the NSA assembled a watch list of American critics of the Pentagon and the intelligence community. Read the results of the Church Committee report. It's available online. They've forgotten all this. The institutional memory of this electorate in this country is astonishing. And these people now embrace the national security bureaucracy as their friends, as a, as a legitimate check on Donald Trump. Forgetting the one cardinal precept of our constitutional system, power flows downward from the elected representatives of the people to the bureaucracy. You know enough about the United States Constitution to know that the framers established three branches of government, presidency, the courts, and the Congress. The bureaucracy was not one of them. Nobody present in Philadelphia in 1787 thought that the bureaucrats were a legitimate check on the elected representatives of the people. No. There was no bureaucracy at the time. When Thomas Jefferson moved into the White House in 1801, the size of the non-military civilian federal workforce in Washington, D.C. was 132 people. Imagine that, 132 people, most of them customs officials and post office officials. The size of the White House staff was one. Thomas Jefferson's personal secretary. Nobody who framed the Constitution thought that unelected bureaucrats who ran the military and the secret intelligence services could substitute their judgment on policy matters for the elected representatives of the people. So, um, wh where does that leave us? Well, you've, you've, seen, you've seen the consequences of this, of this phenomenon, um, and it's, it's alarming. Um, Hillary Clinton didn't handle her email very responsibly, probably. But, and this is an important but, she didn't do anything illegal, according to James Comey. The FBI never recommended prosecution to the Justice Department for anything she did with her email. Instead, the director of the FBI, James Comey, stood up at a press conference and said to the nation, Hillary Clinton has been grossly negligent in the handling of her email. Well, guess what? The FBI is not a national school marm. Its function is not to tell people what's polite, what's improper. Its function is to report to the Justice Department on violations of the law. Violations of the law. Not to excoriate members of the public for doing something that are entire, things that are entirely legal that the FBI regards as somehow improper. And it's not just the FBI. Some people were happy, take the Trump administration, that this uh, economic advisor, Gary Cohn, in Bob Woodward's book, 
um, reportedly took a letter off of Trump's desk, covertly removed a letter from Trump's desk under which he would have terminated a trade agreement with South Korea. You know what? Trump campaigned on a platform that the people voted for. Nobody elected Gary Cohn to substitute his judgment for the judgment of the elected president of the American people. That's not the system, it's the system that the framers gave us. Um, so there's, there's a tremendous danger here of an inversion of our constitutional order in the remnants of double government. And the danger is that somehow the American people so um, concerned about the illiberalism of Donald Trump will turn to the equally illiberal national security bureaucracy in the hope that it will check Trump. The danger, in short, is that we will move to a system in which the elected representatives of the people are checked by an unelected national security bureaucracy. No one seriously would think of that system as a democracy. Now, I know some of you have questions, and I'm happy to uh, answer them at this point. Thank you. Yes? Um, <laughs> sorry, I just had a question about um, when, you were talk when you were discussing the kind of role of the judiciary and how the courts typically kind of defer to these agencies. Is that because um, I did? I took a class this semester that was dealing more with environmental law, but one of the things that kept coming up is that um, any complaints with the agencies must first be funneled through the agencies. So I know that's the process with the EPA. Is that similar with the NSA and um, the FBI? That's a good question. Um, you have a good course. It's a fairly sophisticated thing to study as an undergraduate. Um, what you're referring to is called um, the uh, exhaustion of administrative remedies, right? And the principle is that if the law establishes an administrative agency to resolve a certain problem, air pollution, water pollution, and you have a complaint about dirty air or dirty water, um, under the statute, you are required to go first to the administrative agency to seek redress. And they will engage in a quasi-judicial proceeding with administrative law judges and hear your complaint. It varies tremendously from agency to agency. But the point is, if you don't do that and you go directly to court, the government will come in and say, hey, wait a minute. This person has not exhausted administrative remedies. And the court will say, correct, case dismissed. You go back to the EPA and make your complaint there. And then if they say no, maybe, maybe you will have standing to um, lodge your complaint in the courts. Um, but that doctrine doesn't arise so often in the realm of national security because the CIA doesn't hear complaints <laughs> from people. The FBI doesn't, doesn't typically hear complaints from the public. The, the National Security Agency and, and related agencies aren't like the Food and Drug Administration or the Federal Trade Commission or, or other agencies that have jurisdiction over 
over these kinds of activities. Typically, the grounds for dismissal are different, and it depends on the subject matter, but war powers cases, for example, typically are dismissed on two grounds, the political question doctrine and the doctrine of standing. The doctrine of standing requires that if you uh, want to get your case heard on the merits, you have to show the court that you have suffered a um, concrete, personal, individuated injury different from that incurred by the person on the street. If, if your complaint is a complaint shared by Joe Sixpack, 330 million other people, you're out. You got to show I'm different somehow. And on war powers issues, very few people can show that. It takes somebody, for example, in the armed services who gets orders, go fight in a war, to go to court and say, hey, wait a minute, these orders are illegal. Congress never authorized this war. I want the court to clarify this. So um, that's one ground. And, and typically, um, war powers cases are also dismissed on the grounds of the of the political question doctrine, that the issue is one that's assigned to the political branches to resolve rather than the courts, Congress and the, and the executive. So the War Powers Resolution, for example, um, continues to be a big question mark. The courts have never adjudicated the constitutionality of the War Powers Resolution 60-day time period because there have been a lot of lawsuits brought over the years challenging violations of the War Powers Resolution in multiple respects, but the courts always dismiss these on grounds of standing of the political question doctrine. Yes? If I may follow up, um, which courts have jurisdiction for these original cases? Would it be federal <coughs> courts or, or state courts? Federal district courts. struck by something you were saying about how the, um, in reference to like the black sites and, and the forms of torture and how they are kind of forced to generate their own legitimacy. Um, in reference to the recent or semi-recent um, <coughs> nomination at, of Gina Haskell, Haskell to um, head the CIA, what do you think that that nomination and subsequent confirmation meant for kind of the state of national security now that we've had um, are Good question. Let me point out first that the, 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 the new friends of Trump's critics, the leaders of the national security bureaucracy in prior administrations, Clapper, Morrell, Hayden, Panetta, all supported Haspel. You go right down the list. Their gift to the nation is the new CIA director who oversaw torture in a black site prison and who tried to cover it up during her hearings and did so successfully by denying the Senate Intelligence Committee the information needed to make an informed judgment on her nomination. Senator Wyden of Oregon, as you may know, said this was the worst failure of intelligence oversight that he had ever seen. They proceeded to pass on her nomination as a consequence of uh, having so so little information. So uh, I, I think it's an extremely unfortunate development, but it's, it's further evidence 
of the extent to which the Intelligence Committee has been co-opted. Co-opted, by the way, is the term that was used by John McCain before he died. He said, surely they have been co-opted. They have been co-opted. And this was evident long before that. Um, the 9-11 the Commission, after the attacks on the Twin Towers, um, looked at the organization of the national security infrastructure throughout the United States government, and they said the intelligence oversight infrastructure is dysfunctional, referring to the two oversight committees of the House and the Senate, dysfunctional. But we've allowed this situation to continue, and no serious reforms have been undertaken. Yes? You mentioned that Congress tends to defer to the judgment or advice of the intelligence um, community because they tend to be like generalists and don't have a lot of expert um, knowledge about these things. So I was curious about um, how you think uh, or what you think the solution to that might be because I'm sure that this has been an issue since I guess the beginning of Congress itself, um, uh, and why you think that this has become more of a problem now rather than before? That's an excellent question. Thank you. <laughs> First, let me tell you what the solution is not. The solution is not to try to put in place fancier administrative fencing. The central problem is that the institutions have been hollowed out, and you can't rely upon the institutions to exercise the authority to fix themselves that they have lost over the decades. For a long time, people such as myself and my generation could go to the courts and file a lawsuit, could go to the Congress and lobby for an amendment to a certain bill, or go to the executive and lobby for the adoption of, a, of, a, of an executive order or, or guidance from the White House to these agencies. These institutions are in such low regard by the public today that it's not realistic to look to them to fix themselves. That's the great crisis that our country is confronting today. It's not a constitutional crisis, it's worse. It's an institutional crisis. The institutions that would normally be available to address this kind of problem are not available because they've been so hollowed out. And you look at the public regard for the Congress today, it's, it stands at about 7%. The only, the only institution in our society that's highly regarded as the military. That's a fairly dangerous thing in a democratic society. The people's institution, the Congress, is the, held in the lowest regard, the institution over which the people have the least con control, the military, is held in the highest regard. What does that bode for our country? So the first half of my answer to your question is you, you can't look to the government to remedy this problem. The, the government is the problem. As Ronald Reagan accurately said, he wasn't referring to this aspect of it, but he was correct in that regard, in, in this sense. Where do you look? And the, the answer is, and this is the answer that was given by the framers of our Constitution, to the people. 
the energy has to come from the outside at two levels. First, you need an informed and engaged electorate. You need voters, citizens, such as yourselves, who, number one, are educated in the affairs of state, and number two, are actively engaged in working to change things through the channels of change that are set up by our Constitution. Justice David Souter said the, the greatest problem that our country is confronting today is pervasive civic ignorance. We don't teach civics in grade school anymore, as most of you know. American history is not a subject that even the, the best college graduates are familiar with. I mean, how many, I, I won't ask for a show of hands, but how many, how many people at, at this very prestigious institution are familiar with the report of the church committee? Most people, most people at Harvard, most people at Tufts where I teach, have never read the report of the church committee. The history of the 1970s is just kind of a black hole. So many important thing, things happened in the, the 1970s. So the first step is you need a citizenry um, imbued with what the framers of our Constitution refer to as civic virtue. And it, it, the, the energy to create that civic virtue and nurture it has to come from the citizens themselves. Judge Learned Hand spoke words that everybody ought to be familiar with. He said, when the spirit of liberty dies in the hearts of the people, no constitution, no court, no law can save it. The second thing that you have to do is, the framers thought, elect public officials who are committed to the public good, not to their own private wealth, not to the advancement of their careers. People who will make the hard decisions, the courageous decisions of the sort that John Kennedy wrote about in Profiles in Courage, sacrificing their own careers, their own livelihood in some cases, for the public good. I knew people like that when I was on the Hill in the 1970s. I worked closely with a number of senators who took very courageous positions and lost because of it. I worked with Frank Church. I was the lawyer for the committee when Frank Church was chairman. Ch Church was from a very conservative state, Idaho. He was running 35 points behind a very conservative Republican opponent at the time. He saw the writing on the wall. He knew he was going to lose or that it was highly probable. And yet he took a very courageous position on multiple issues, including, for example, the Panama Canal Treaties, which was very unpopular in Idaho. I don't see that kind of courage today in Congress. I don't see that kind of courage. And it's not there because the people don't insist upon it. Those people are out there in this country today, but they just need to be encouraged to run for office and to support people with a backbone. Um, do you believe that, um, you know, given the ongoing tensions between um, President Trump and the national security agencies, do you believe that there's a chance that the security agencies would view him in some way as a security threat because of the policies that is enacted, um, some of which are at odds with what the agencies would prefer? And if so, what do you think is the consequence? Yes, I, I think that the United States is in danger of having its government dominated by the security agencies by the national security bureaucracy. Uh, the, the danger is that 
well-intentioned opponents of Donald Trump will embrace the national security bureaucracy as the enemy of their enemy without realizing what that bureaucracy has done in history when it has been unfettered, not subject to the chains of democratic accountability. And it's not as though these agencies come to the table with a clean slate. These are agencies that have a demonstrated propensity to transgress legal limits when they are unsupervised. And again, look back on their history and the fact that the so-called restraints that have been put in place are flimsy, are flimsy. You know, um, the church committee recommended, in effect, for example, that um, <clears throat> a charter be enacted spelling out what the FBI can do and placing clear limits on what the FBI cannot do. This was opposed by conservative Republicans. We don't want to put limits on the FBI. Look at the results. How ironic today a conservative Republican president finds himself the target of an FBI counterintelligence investigation. Now, lest you think th this is um, somehow not something to be of concern, go back to your computers this afternoon or this evening and give yourself a little test. Spend an hour trying to get an answer to this question. When can the FBI investigate me? Very simple question. Spoiler alert, I'll tell you what you'll find. You won't find an answer. There's nothing in the law, nothing in any executive order, nothing in the Attorney General's foreign counterintelligence guidelines that will answer the question. The short answer is the FBI investigates pretty much anybody that it would like to investigate, now as it did prior to the Church Committee. The reforms that were put in place died because for a lot of reasons that, that, that relate to the history of the 1970s. But the, the short answer to your question, therefore, is um, there are reforms that need to be put in place to limit the authority of these agencies that are no longer being contemplated because the agencies are seen wrongly as the tormentors of Donald Trump that can be counted on because they engage in these anti-Trump initiatives. They can be counted on to come down on the side of civil liberties. Well, Gina Haspel is their answer to civil liberties. So you talked about one of the bigger problems with the lack of accountability is the fact that courts largely won't or can't try, you know, or try the agencies and hear lawsuits about them. So, like, considering that, you know, 
the the state secret exemption is like probably grounded in some pretty reasonable things. Like what what do you think that the best course of action would be in terms of increasing like accountability for these agencies? Well, that was the question that was essentially asked a minute ago, and my my answer was. You, you can't look to Congress or the courts or the executive to make them more accountable because the incentive structure is going to remain the same. The, the problem lies in incentives that are deeply embedded within the structure of the system. And if you, if you cosmetically changed, for example, reporting requirements and oversight responsibilities, sooner or later you'd find the same kind of co-option and dysfunctionality occurring within the oversight structure that we have now. The, the ultimate check on autocracy is an enlightened people. And I, I, I know that's not, that's not a, a, a satisfying answer to people who are, you know, looking for a five-part program to fix this problem. Well, it's, it's not like, you know, fixing the, the problem of automobile exhaust or cell phone use when driving. You know, if you're governor of Massachusetts, you solve the problem by proposing to the legislature that they enact a law banning cell phones in cars, as Baker did this morning. It's not that kind of problem. It's, it's, it's pervasive, it's structural, and in order to address the roots of the problem, you have to move beyond the deficient structure. The energy has to come from outside the structure. It has to come from the people. And if, if the American people and, and their leaders are not aware of the need to hold these extremely dangerous agencies in check, um, no law, no constitution, no court case is going to do that. So, you know, I could, I could go down a long list of, of cosmetic reforms, um, but ultimately that's, that's not the right approach. I, and I, I know that that's emotionally unsatisfying for you to hear, and it's emotionally unsatisfying for a lawyer to contemplate. Look, I've been, like my colleagues, raised in a system where if there's a problem, you look to the legal system, the institutional structure to remedy it. It's very simple. Problem A, lawsuit X. Lawsuit X. You win, problem A solved. You move on to problem B. This ain't like that. And the, the, the first thing we've got to do is disabuse ourselves of that mindset. This is a, a far more pervasive systemic problem. And the institutions that we would normally look to to provide the answers of the sort that you're looking for rightly are just not available. They're, they're, they're hollowed out, as I say. Yes? I guess as a follow-up, like if the check on autocracy is enlightened people, you know, if the institutions that we would turn to in order to actually achieve any change are so, you know, blinded by their own power that they're incapable of acting, like what's really the point of being enlightened if we just have knowledge but we can't do anything to actually change you know what's going on because the institutions as you said will have the same incentive structure regardless of how much information we as people have you can change things you can elect different people 
It's that simple. That's what I'm saying. You can elect, you can, you can be part of a body politic possessed of civic virtue, as the framers described it. People who are knowledgeable about what the problems are, people who are knowledgeable about the kinds of officials who need to be elected and the personal characteristics that those individuals need to have in order to address the problems. And then you can get those people into office. That's, that's a, a very simple and straightforward and immensely difficult solution. Yes? As a follow-up to that, in your opinion, would it be more effective to elect someone critical of double government, such as Trump, or someone that sort of um, embraces the ideals of double government? Like, I suppose, um, I, I feel like, well, the establishment, I guess. Work within the system or work outside the system. First of all, I don't think there is such a thing as double government anymore. The double government has collapsed, and it's collapsed, as Badgett predicted, as a result of this rift between the presidency and the national security bureaucracy. It's fallen to earth. So double, double government is essentially like the, harmon the harmony of the two. Correct. That's exactly right. It, and it's the harmony that is essential for it to work, and it's not working anymore. And the chaos and confusion and craziness that you're seeing is part of the result. So what's the solution? Um, <laughs> you're, you're, you're reminding me, your, your question reminds me a little, and I know you're not asking this question, which I was kind of appalled by, um, but I, I talked about this at an at a advanced poli-sci seminar at Harvard a while ago. And one of the students in the seminar, who's an honors poli-sci student, said to me, um, thinking about her career, she said, you know, um, why should I be concerned about the strength of the national security bureaucracy? I can, instead of going to work for a congressional committee, I can just go to work for the NSA. <laughs> um, well, there's, there's a slight difference there. Um, you know, the, the NSA doesn't exactly have the um, democratic accountability of a congressional committee. Um, so um, your, your, your question really is, um, where does somebody interested in reform work? I think if you if you're if you're interested in a career in government to take your question a step or two down the line, this is a question that my students ask with some regularity. Frankly, a lot of them don't want to have anything to do with Donald Trump. They don't want to be associated with his administration. And a lot of them, moreover, um, don't want much to be associated with the national security bureaucracy either. We have people where I teach at the Fletcher School, which is a graduate school, who are on leave from elements of the national security bureaucracy. More than one of those students doesn't look forward to going back, and more than one has, has resigned. I wish I had a happy answer for you. Um, my own answer, uh, my, the answer that I gave when I was asked the question two days after Trump was elected um, in, a, in an assembly that we had a student assembly of our whole student body. Somebody asked me whether I would consider working for Donald Trump. And my answer was I would flip hamburgers before I work for Donald Trump. Um, but you know, 
I could see if you had the job of White House Chief of Staff, as General John Kelly did, or Secretary of Defense, as General Mattis did, um, being a patriotic American who was not interested in lining his resume any further, and I don't think those two individuals were. I think they were, they were interested in restraining a president whose conduct they were concerned about. Uh, I could see how somebody would take a job like that, thinking, you know, I may prevent some real harm from being done in a position such as that. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't condemn somebody who acts from that motive. I just want to point out to you, however, the tremendous danger in bureaucratic checking of a president. You know, it's one thing to check unlawful conduct on the part of a president. If you're a staffer or head of an agency or the Secretary of Defense or White House Chief of Staff, it's one thing to to try to talk a president out of doing something illegal. It's quite another, however, to try to stop a president from engaging in a policy that you might disagree with, but that he was elected to carry out. You know, take, take the, the policy of, say, disengaging from the Middle East or having a more reduced military presence in, in Europe or, or um, encouraging our NATO allies to pay more money. You know, that policy uh, of, of a lower military visibility in Europe was uh, supported by liberals for decades before Donald Trump ever appeared on the scene. Mike Mansfield, when he was majority leader of the Senate, a great liberal Democrat from Montana who was Lyndon Johnson's protege, um, actually introduced legislation requiring a reduction of the American troop presence in Europe. His position was, um, decades after World War II, it's ridiculous for the United States to help still have tens of thousands of troops stationed in Europe. They ought to be doing much more for their own defense. Fulbright, Church, McGovern all said the same things. Now, suddenly, a lot of liberals hear Donald Trump saying something similar, and they think, well, if Trump says it, boy, it must be wrong. We have to be on the other side. Well, you know, that's kind of what Republicans did, a lot of them during the Obama administration. A lot of Republicans in Congress thought anything Obama is for, we will be against. That's a very dangerous way for our country to proceed. You have to look at the ideas on their merits. Imagine that the idea or policy was being proposed by a president of the other party. That's what I mean. You've got to have public officials who support the public good, not the advancement of their own career, their own political party. Um, so speaking of, I guess, like public officials who some say are, are there for the, the state rather than um, a specific party, the recent nomination of William Barr as well um, to head the Justice Department, um, I think brings up the question of, of where the DOJ stands in between these, well, as kind of a central point, I guess, between the um, national intelligence agencies that you've been discussing and then the kind of a more established executive branch. So how do you think going forward that the DOJ will, I guess, serve as a barrier or perhaps, yeah, a barrier between the two? Or do you believe that it will rather, um, I guess, 
guess we can facilitate dialogue between the two? That's a very sophisticated question. Let me put it slightly differently. Um, I, I think you're on to something critically important and very, very difficult. And the, the question that you, you kind of tiptoe around is, where is the Justice Department going to come down on the issue of the unitary executive? Now, for those of you who are not political science majors, the idea of the unitary executive is the executive branch is a kind of pyramid. And at the top of the pyramid sits the president. Everybody in the executive branch takes orders from the president of the United States. The president is the chief law enforcement officer of the country not the Attorney General, not Robert Mueller, the President. They work for him. And none other than James Comey himself kind of signed on to that theory. The press didn't really pick this up. Go back, look at the transcript. He was asked a question by Senator Lankford of Oklahoma. The question was this. The subject under discussion was Trump's uh, uh, conversation with Comey uh, concerning uh, Flynn. And Comey testified that Trump told him, you know, you should go easy on Flynn. He's a good guy. And Langford said, well, suppose, suppose Trump told you to drop the investigation of Flynn. Constitutionally, could he have done that? And Comey said, I think so. Everybody in the executive branch works for the president. That's the theory of the unitary presidency. The Constitution says specifically the president is charged with faithfully executing the law not the Attorney General, not Robert Mueller, not James Comey, the President. Everybody works for him. Now, that creates a slight problem. <laughs> and the problem is, what do you do in a system like that about presidential wrongdoing? or wrongdoing by presidential subordinates. Can the president protect everybody within his little circle of friends who might be engaged in some kind of illegality? So we have improvised an answer to that problem. We started improvising the answer in the 1870s. The improvised answer is called special counsel or independent counsel. We've had somewhere in the realm of six, seven, eight independent counsels appointed beginning with the administration of President Grant. And they have sometimes been authorized by statute, sometimes simply been appointed by the President. But the idea is essentially that no one is above the law. 
That's fundamental to the rule of law, equal justice under law for the powerful as well as the weak. And that means for the president as well as everybody else. The president is not a king. The idea that the king can do no wrong is foreign to the American system. So when the president or his staff engage in illegality, it's important to have a check on the president. The problem is, if you buy the theory of the unitary presidency, special counsels are a square peg in a round hole. They don't fit into a system in which the president is the boss of everybody within the executive branch. And that is exactly what Lankford and Comey were addressing. So your question is, how is Barr likely to resolve this terrible dilemma? Is Barr say, likely to follow presidential orders if the president tells him what, hypothetically? I don't want Mueller's report to see the light of day. I want Mueller fired. There are multiple variations on that theme, all of which Trump could convey to Barr on the theory of the unitary executive. We have a pyramid. I'm at the top of the pyramid. You, everybody else works for me. I say drop it. I say you're fired. The end. Period. Full stop. Is Barr likely to accept that theory? Not from my understanding of his hearings, but... read the fine print. He left himself a lot of wiggle room. He said he would abide by the existing regulations in effect at the Justice Department. So um, th that's, the, that's the $64 million question <coughs> in a way. Which way is, is Barr likely to come down on this, this dilemma that you've posed for us? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I'll simply tell you this. Um, I think it's important not to resolve that dilemma. And I hope that neither Attorney General William Barr, nor the Supreme Court, nor any other institution in our society resolves it firmly and finally. I'm what you might call a constitutional minimalist, and I believe that the courts, to the extent possible, ought to avoid deciding hard cases. Hard cases make bad law, as Justice Holmes said. And one of the reasons that they do is there are powerful arguments and interests and values on both sides. And it's important in a democracy such as ours that that whole set of values and countervailing interests not be discarded completely to give controlling weight to the other side of the ledger. It's important to allow those competing values and interests to continue to coexist. And we have for 230 years. And you do that by, as I've said, improvising on a case-by-case -case basis recognizing that no constitution can survive 
if it takes an absolutist position on questions like this on one side or the other? That's an excellent question. Are you a poli sci major? Maybe. I don't know. We'll see. In reference to what was just discussed, so I'm not a poli sci major, so correct me if I'm wrong, but from my understanding, the DOJ and the intelligence agencies mostly answer to the president, and then Congress is its own sort of separate entity. And I know that there have been talks of, a, of some sort of bill to protect Mueller, as they say, by um, putting some sort of restriction on the president being unable to ask the DOJ to have him be fired or to stop his investigation. And so I was wondering, I, I know you mentioned that there isn't really any institution that can like fully resolve um, this issue, but I was curious as to um, what you think in terms of how much power Congress has over the president when it comes to this issue. The answer is unclear, and it needs to remain unclear. That's my answer. First of all, the, the legislation that you're referring to poses an academic question. The, the legislation, even if it were enacted by Congress, clearly would be vetoed by President Trump. And there's no way that Congress could muster a two-thirds majority uh, in either house at this point, even a Democratic House of Representatives, to override a presidential veto. It's a useful political gambit on the part of Trump's opponents. But frankly and honestly, that's really all it is at this point, a political gambit. Second, um, it's not clear that you can prohibit the president from firing uh, someone such as Mueller by statute because of the ambiguity within our system that I've just told you I think we need to retain. What you can do is to put limits, limits on the president's ability to do that by, for example, requiring that the individual only be fired for cause, for misconduct, for grossly exceeding his or her authority, for some identifiable, articulable kind of misconduct. Um, I don't have any difficulty doing that. We, we already have many statutes on the books that do that. But um, ultimately, I, I, I don't think we should waste a lot of effort thinking about an academic issue. Yes? And if you could just indulge me a couple of like, history questions about the things that you were referencing um, in your talk. The first was the Trumanite network, um, which you said came about under Truman. Would that be uh, at the beginning or the end of his presidency? It began about 1947 and continued through 1952. In in 1947, the National Security Act was enacted, and it created the CIA. During World War II, the, the intelligence service was called the OSS, and it was an executive creation. There was no statutory authority for it. So the um, CIA was set up in 1947. National Security Council was also set up for the first time in the National Security Act in 1947. 
1952, Truman issued a secret executive order setting up the National Security Agency. NSA was for a long time jokingly said to mean no such agency. The National Security Agency, as you know, is the agency that intercepts communications largely f abroad between um, elements of other governments and breaks codes and, and listens in on foreign military communications and diplomatic communications. Um, it, it was super secret for through into the Nixon administration. There's a place in the Watergate tapes where Nixon, a member of his staff on the tapes, refers to the NSA and Nixon says, NSA, what's that? You know, he's, Nixon has already in the Houston plan authorized the NSA to do something that his lawyer just told him is illegal and Nixon doesn't even know what, what the NSA was. It's an extraordinary, very candid question. Um, Truman also um, consolidated the military by setting up the Joint Chiefs of Staff um, in the uh, in the early part of earlier part of his his administration. It, there's an interesting twist that occurred um, politically. And, and ironically, these reforms of Truman were opposed by conservative Republicans who said Truman was risking creating a Gestapo with the CIA and um, cr moving the United States towards a garrison state by setting up the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Um, and it was liberal Democrats, Senator Paul Douglas of Illinois, Senator Hubert Humphrey of Minnesota, who said, no, these reforms are needed to contain Russia and Stalin that pose an emerging threat to the United States. We need to centralize the authority of the national security bureaucracy. And Truman's Truman himself, according to his counsel, Clark Clifford, in his memoirs, Truman was very distrustful of the FBI. He viewed the FBI as a potential Gestapo, but he thought that um, centralizing the authority as he did within the military and intelligence communities um, was less risky than the, the decentralized and fractured administrative structure that he would then have to look to to contain the Soviet Union. And at the time, the policy of the United States was just taking shape and it was going to be containment. And Truman's view was that containment required greater centralization. And then the second historical question, um, in reference to the special counsel, you said that it began with the presidency of Grant. Was that the, the Whiskey Gang or something? Yes, it was. Okay. It was, exactly. Glad to know the history lesson straight off. <laughs> Any other questions before we break? Or before we get small groups? <laughs> All right. Good. Thank you. <laughs>